Thanks for joining us today. We're excited that you came across this message. The sermon you're about to watch is from our teaching series, The Dearest Place on Earth. During this series, we are exploring some important questions about the church. A lot of people have opinions about the church, experiences with the church, or maybe even some preconceived notions about what the church is. What we want to do is take a look at how the Bible answers these four questions. What is the church? Who leads the church? What does it mean to be a part of a church? And what is the mission of the church? If you're joining us for the first time today, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open the Hope Church LV app or visit HopeChurchLV.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. The church is the most beautiful, powerful, and transformative institution on the planet. To unify every class and culture of people and birth community despite our differences. No other institution has been commissioned with the life-changing gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. To bring people from every tribe, tongue, and nation from death to life. The church is not an event we attend or a building we enter, but a family we grow with and people we love. This is the church. This is the church. So, imperfect as it is, it is the nearest place on earth to us. All right, church family. Well, we have some business to take care of. Some of you knew this was coming. You've been practicing all week. We all together are going to out loud say Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I know every person in the room has it memorized. And so we are all going to say it together. And I really, really hope I'm not the only one, okay? Not going to call anybody individually. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. One, two, three. And let us consider how to stir up one another, okay, it's good, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing year, near. I think I might've messed that up a little bit, but we did it. Give yourselves a round of applause. You may be thinking, what on earth was that for the last four weeks of this series? We have been as a way to highlight the fact that as followers of Jesus, we love and live in God's word. We are memorizing, we're memorizing those two verses of scripture. There's still time, you can still do it. We're actually gonna do that throughout our year in different sermon series as a way to show that life mark that we love and live in God's word, memorize scripture together as a family. Speaking of the word of God, go ahead and grab it. We're gonna be in Matthew chapter 28. Hopefully you have it open there on your lap or maybe on an app, Matthew 28. We're gonna be there in just a little while. I wanna begin by asking probably the most existential question that exists. Billions upon billions of people have asked this question. I have asked this question. Maybe you have asked this question. Here it is. What is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose? That's a very existential question. Like billions of people across the ages have asked that question. Maybe you're even in the room today because you're asking that question, seeking to see an answer to that question. I'm gonna talk about that today. As I was preparing for this, I remembered, some of you know my story. I grew up here in Las Vegas. I did not grow up in the community of the church and grew up really skateboarding and playing music, specifically punk rock music. And so I began to write songs at an early age and I actually got out the old song book I found in the, uh, in the closet this week. This right here are full of some punk rock gems. You don't even know. There are all kinds of emo. If you don't know what that is, just Google it later. But it is, it's got some gems in here from 15-year-old Scott. But I was typing out that question, what is the purpose of my life? And I remembered, wait a minute, I wrote a song about that when I was 15. And so I went and found the song that I wrote about that that I want to share with my church family. It's simply called Life's Purpose. You're not ready for the depth of these lyrics. 15 years old with all the angst of a punk rock singer in his garage, here's what I said. Why do we live? What are we here for? 
Is it a big experiment or is it deeper? Is it more? See how this is deep. <laughs> is it more involved than any of us think? Pastor Teddy, I don't know why I have not won a Grammy for that song. If you know anybody, let me know. This is the question I was asking when I was 15 years old. And to 15-year-old punk rock Scott and to my church family, I want to say yes. I want to say there is a purpose for life that we are going to talk about today. We are invited, all of us, to an exciting, unbelievable, life-changing, joy-bringing, world-changing mission that every single one of us have been invited to that is purposeful. We're going to explore that together today. If you're just joining us, we are finishing up a four-week journey through a series talking about the church. We prayed that this series would change, forever change our fellowship. We've been saying something on repeat every week of the series. The church is not a place. The church is a people. One more time, let's say that out loud together. The church is not a place. The church is a people. We've been saying over and over again, the church is not a place. It is a people who have been placed by a sovereign God. You are not here on accident. You have been placed in this family on purpose. We've discovered together what the church is. The church is universal, meaning all across the world, across all the ages, God has been building his family, his church. Some people call it the big C church. It's the universal global church. We've explored that the church is also local. Most of the time in the New Testament, when the Bible talks about the church, it's talking about the local church. It's a specific group of Jesus followers placed together for worship, community, and mission. Hope Church is a local church in Las Vegas, Henderson, Boulder City, three congregations, one church, the household of God. We're called his bride. We are not perfect, but we are his. We are desperate for Jesus, looking to him for everything we have. We've discovered who leads the church. And praise God, his name is Jesus. He is the head of the church. He has ultimate authority in the church. But in his grace and by his providence, he empowers human leadership to lovingly serve and lead his bride through the grace that he alone supplies. Last week, we discovered what it means to be a part of the church. Just like our physical bodies, every part in the body of Christ has a purpose. We need each other to function well. Over 50 times in the New Testament, we are told how to one another each other. The health of the whole is dependent on the parts. This is what we read about the church, the dearest place on earth. If you're a part of the family and you haven't been on the journey with us, I highly recommend you go back online because this is the series we want to continue to see change our fellowship. So here's the third, fourth and final question we have to ask and answer today. What is the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church, just like the last several weeks, praise God, the word of God tells us the answer. After Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world and gloriously rose again from the dead, he appeared to his disciples for about 40 days, ministering and teaching. And just before he ascended to the Father forever to be reigning and ruling where he is today, he gave us the mission. We're going to read it in Matthew chapter 28. Hopefully you have it open. We're going to read verses 16 to 20. This is God's word. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's be honest, as you read the Bible, there are passages of Scripture that are pretty hard to understand. There's passages of Scripture that you got to read several times to really understand it. I would submit to you today that the verses we just read are not one of those passages. This is pretty cut and dry. Jesus gives us a clear mission. So we're going to walk through it piece by piece. I want to lay down three foundational truths for us today as some groundwork and then a challenge as we end this series and as we end this sermon as 
a church family. Here's the first foundational truth. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. That's what verse 18 says. Look at it again. It says all authority. Someone say all authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice as Jesus gathers his disciples to give them their marching orders before he ascends to the Father, he doesn't start with a command. He starts with a claim. He says, all authority has been given to me. That word all is a word that means its entirety, totality, supreme authority. Jesus is telling his disciples, there's a boss over all the universe and it is me. I am the one who has all authority, universal Authority. If you're with us as a family, you know we've been studying verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. We're going to jump back into that very soon. But in our study of Mark, we're 10 chapters in over the last few years. We've seen this to be true. God is the God of authority over everything. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has authority over nature and nations, demons and disease, sin and death. He has authority over everything that breathes, everything that has life. Jesus says, I have all authority. Every person in this room, listen, whether you want to give him the glory, do his name or not, your next breath comes because he says so. All authority. This is who we see speaking these words. He has all authority. I love how Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says it. This is a big God passage if you want to underline it in your Bible. He, that's Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. What's that saying? God in the flesh. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I know this is just a cross-reference and not our main text, but I had a little glory worship moment in the study this week when I read that last sentence. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If you know your Old Testament, you know that priests never sat down. Priests were busy constantly trying to atone for sin, constantly more ministry to do. That's why Jesus is the better high priest because when he purified our sin, it is done once and for all. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. It is finished. Jesus is not wringing his hands today wondering what sin he needs to purify and atone for. It's done. He sat down. Why? Because he has all authority. Why does this matter for us? It matters because his command in the world gives me confidence in the world. His rule over everything in life gives me a reason for everything in life. Jesus has all authority. And here's the best part. This God with all authority invites you and I to be a part of what he is doing. He doesn't have to do that, and he doesn't need us. Jesus does not need you and I to accomplish his mission, but he's so good, he invites us to be a part of what he is doing in the world that he has all authority of. David Platt helps us here, pastor and author. He says, we are on the front lines of a spiritual battle that is raging for the souls of men and women around the world. And the all-sovereign Son of God, our Savior, is in command of a commission that will be accomplished. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. Here's the second foundational truth right out of these verses. Every Jesus follower must make disciples. Every Jesus follower must make disciples. Look at verse 19. Go therefore and, what are those next two words? Make disciples. <laughs> Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now as you read these verses in English, it looks like we're given four things to do. Some of you guys saw, here are the four things according to English that we are to do. We are to go, make disciples, teach, and baptize. Some of you guys might have those underlined, but I want you to see in the original Greek language that this was written in, there's actually only one imperative verb in this passage. And it's what was highlighted on the screen, make disciples. The only command that's imperative on us that we are to do is make disciples. You say, okay, so what's up with go, baptize, and teach? Those are actually verbal adjectives showing you how you make disciples. Go, baptize, teach. 
These are how we make disciples. I want us to see Jesus gave his followers one mission. Make disciples. That's why we said every Jesus follower must make disciples because it is an imperative verb. We must make disciples. For 23 years as a church family, we have had a contextualized mission statement based on our desire to make disciples out of Matthew chapter 28. For 23 years, we have said we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. What is that? That is our contextualized version of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go make disciples. We want to help people abide in Christ, connect in community, share in the mission. We want to help people understand the life of a Jesus follower. And really the life of a Jesus follower is the life of a disciple. A disciple is a Jesus follower. It's a word that actually really means apprentice. Somebody studying under the rabbi Jesus. Kent Hughes helps us here. He said on this word disciple, it's an educational term. We are to enroll people in the school of Christ and tutor them meticulously mentoring them month by month, helping them mature in Christ. We are striving not merely for a lost soul to make a decision about Christ, but we are striving for a lost soul to make a dramatic and permanent change of personal allegiance to Christ. That's the mission, to make disciples. Remember, this is not given to one single Jesus follower out in a field somewhere. It is given to a community of disciples. Discipleship happens in community. That's where Jesus followers grow. In the context of the local community is where we baptize and teach and are sent out to go and to multiply. Remember back in week one, we talked about some metaphors of the church. One of them is the household of God. As as Jesus adopts people into his spiritual family by grace through faith in Christ in salvation, they become a part of our spiritual family where they are to flourish and grow as followers of Jesus in the household of God. And disciples are made that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. That is the mission of the church, to make disciples. Now, some of you see that on the screen and go... Yes, I am so glad that I go to a church that makes disciples. In fact, Scott, I can't wait to see all the disciples that Hope Church makes. Specifically you, go get them, Pastor. You go make those disciples. I know you got a staff. We're like a disciple-making factory around here. And I'm just going to watch and see all the disciples that you guys make. Hold that thought if you're thinking that right now. My wife and I are very different. I grew up loving sports. She grew up not caring about sports at all. Fast forward a bunch of years, I still love sports. She doesn't care about sports at all. Specifically, I love football. Specifically, I love the Dallas Cowboys. Hold your applause. I'm now raising a couple Dallas Cowboy disciples and my two sons. And there's a specific way, if you're a sports fan, you understand this, that I talk about the Dallas Cowboys. See, I talk about them like this. I say, We lost today. It's not a them, it's a us. We need a new coach, which by the way, we do need a new coach. We, we, we. And every once in a while from the kitchen, my wife will say, what do you mean we? Did I miss the part where you're suited up and you're on the field playing this game? Better yet, did I miss the part where we got a check from the Dallas Cowboys? I don't see the we. And she's actually right, right? I, I'm, I'm not on the team. It is them and me. I'm on the couch, armchair quarterbacking, thinking I could do it better. See, the problem is we've let that seep into the church family. And how I talk about the Dallas Cowboys is, is inaccurate. It, 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 what is inaccurate when talking about the Dallas Cowboys is actually spot on when talking about the church It's not saying, you go do this, church. You, you, you. It's no, no, we. Me and you and us is we. See, the the church was given a mission to make disciples. Who's the church? The church is the people. So all of us are called to make disciples. We get so off base when we say, you know what? Go make disciples, professional Christians. Go make disciples, really mature Christians. Instead of the church being all that we are and all of our imperfection, the dearest place on earth, listening to the mandate on our lives to make disciples. You and me and us is we. And we are called to make 
disciples. David Platt helps us again. He says, according to Jesus, from beginning to end, to be a disciple is to make disciples. Scripture knows nothing of disciples who aren't making disciples. And let me remind you, disciple is not some higher level of a follower of Jesus. A Jesus follower is a disciple. So every Jesus follower must make disciples. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now some of you may be thinking, I don't know how to do that. I hear it, I see it, but I am not equipped to do this. I got kids and a job and a demanding schedule. Like I don't know, I am inadequate to do what the Bible is telling me I am to do. And to that I would actually agree that you are inadequate. And so is every other person on the planet. Which is why I'm grateful for our third foundational truth that we see from Jesus. Every Jesus follower is never alone. Look at verse 20, the second half of it. Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is how the book of Matthew ends. Don't miss this. Jesus didn't say, okay, disciples, go do it with all your great sermons and all your great skill set and all your great passion. Go do what I've called you to do. No, he didn't just send them out on their own strength. He reminded them just before he left, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Some of you need to hear this. Jesus follower, you are never alone. And some of you need to really listen to that because it's been a tough week and you feel pretty far from God right now. As a follower of Jesus, you are never far from God because he's given you a promise that he is with you always. In fact, when you and I put our faith in the finished work of Jesus, when he paid for our sin in full, he gave us resurrection life when he rose from the dead, he gave us a seal, a stamp, a promise that we are never alone. And it's the promise of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God lives in every single follower of Jesus as a promise that you have been saved. The, tr the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, is a sign of your redemption. Let's put some Bible on that. Ephesians chapter 1. In him you also that's Jesus. When you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, don't miss this, were sealed, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your inheritance. Take it to the bank on God. There is no getting that out what he put in. It's the seal of your salvation until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Listen, you are never alone, Jesus follower. You aren't alone in the everyday demands of life and you are not alone in this command on your life to make disciples. And this is such good news for us. Because if it were up to you and I to do what Jesus is commanding us to do, we would fail every single time. The mission is not based on what you and I can do. The mission is based on Christ's presence through his spirit in you. So it doesn't matter how gifted our church is, how financially stable our church is, how passionate the people are. We can do nothing apart from the Spirit of God alive and at work in and through us. But if he is, and we're hungry and passionate and willing, if we're a, a humble, hungry, passionate group of followers of Jesus placed together, I believe neighborhoods and nations can be shaken up for the glory of God right here from this place. And that's what I'm praying for. I've been praying that God would do a work here that it would be undeniable that there's just some hungry, humble, passionate followers of Jesus trusting him to do what he wants to do in and through us as we make disciples. Foundational truths. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. Every Jesus follower must make disciples and every Jesus follower is never alone. Our mission as a church is to make disciples. So what have we learned as we bring this to a close? What have we learned in this series? We've learned that Jesus loves the church. He died to establish this family, the body of Christ he is the head. We are members of the body. You have been invited by the king who has all authority in the universe to a grand mission of growing this global family and this local body where we can be a place in Las Vegas and Henderson and Boulder City for disciples to be made who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. The question I want to end with for every follower of Jesus who calls Hope Church home for us to wrestle with is this. What are you 
giving your life to. We've been saying all series long, this is kind of a a home team series. If you're a guest here, if you're a visitor, we're so grateful you're here. Hope the word of God has encouraged you today. But for the home team, for the Hope Church family, as you've heard these messages, if you've heard the word of God bear weight on your lives, the question I want us to wrestle with for just a few moments as we close is what are you giving your life to? Because we are all giving our lives to something. Either by default or by design, your life is being poured out for a purpose. The question is, what is that purpose? Here's some grim news to discourage you for just a moment. (laughs) Every single one of us will one day pass away. I know it's harsh news to realize, but every single one of us, 100%, we will die. (laughs) Guaranteed, there will be a day where your days come to an end on this earth. Early Christians, in fact, would, would on purpose remind themselves of this as a way to keep the mission bigger than their mortality. Great church father Tertullian said this, look after yourself, remember you're a man, remember you will die. I think we have that quote. Tertullian? No? Okay, maybe we don't. It froze. Look after yourself, remember you're a man, remember you will die. There it is. He wrote that last phrase in Latin, and it's the Latin phrase, memento mori. Maybe some of you have heard that. This idea of of keeping our mortality is why, in mind, is why churches used to have graveyards on their premises. You ever notice that? It's so as they leave the church gathering every week, they would remember memento mori. We will not be here forever. It's why old pastors and and theologians used to work with a skull on their desk, not because they were goths, but because they wanted to remember memento mori. As I study for sermons, as I pastor, as I shepherd, as I counsel, I will not be here forever. My life needs to be invested in something that will outlast it, memento mori. There's a mission that's bigger than my life, and I do well to remember that. We will all one day die. So what are you giving your life to while you have it? There's really three options that I'd like to explore together. Three options that we can have with our lives. I can waste my life, I can spend my life, or I can invest my life. We can waste our lives. We can chase all that this world has to offer. We can focus on ourselves. We can get to the end of our lives and realize they have been Wasted. People fill the world and even fill church buildings who do this very thing. And if we're honest, this is the natural tendency of our flesh. Left to myself, I will waste my life. I will chase it and waste it. We can waste our lives, every single one of us. But we could also spend our lives. We can utilize the time we've been given to spend it well. This isn't bad, it's just not best. But you can map out your life on a vision board, my academics, my sport, my career, my my family, my money. I can map it all out. But even the life that is best spent will still come to an end. There's many passages of scripture that help us and remind us of this. My favorite is Psalm 90 verse 10. Psalmist says, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass. And then we fly away. Even a life well spent is still a life that cannot outlast itself. That's why the great philosopher William James had this quote. He said, the great use of a life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. This is the kind of people we want to be at Hope Church We want to be people that invest our lives. This is what we've been talking about for four weeks, to be the kind of people that that wring our lives out, not just for personal ambition, but for a powerful mission to see the kingdom expand right before our very eyes, to be a part of the most epic, world-changing, life-giving, joy-bringing mission ever to make disciples and get involved in what God is doing. Remember what he said in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I will build my church. Count on it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The question I have for you, church family, is how do you think he intends to do that? Through everyday followers of Jesus. Trusting the spirit of God in them 
to do through them what he desires. And disciples are made, and disciples are made, and disciples are made. It's actually why you and I are in the room today, because some serious disciples heard the command on that hillside that day. And you're in the room a few thousand years, a couple thousand years later, because they took serious what God wanted to do in and through them. What if we did that as a family? When I think about it, it fires me up. It fires me up to think, what could God do with some humble, hungry people that come to Hope Church and are a part of this community and are a part of this church family? Remember what we talked about. When we say our Hope Church family, what are we talking about? A local community of baptized Jesus followers under biblical leadership, uniting together in doctrine, using their spiritual gifts to serve one another and being sent to make disciples. Imagine if we all said, yes, I'm in, and we went all in together. Dream with me for a minute. What if we really believed that our time was not just for our work and school and for relaxing, but we invested our time into seeing disciples made and the kingdom of God expanded and the church being built? Imagine if we believed that our money was for more than just us and our families, but was actually given to us as a tool to build the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Imagine if we use every gift and skill and knowledge and experience you have. God has given to you those, not so that you could just use them on your own, but you could use them for the kingdom of God and you could see his church be built and disciples made that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. We want to be the kind of people that don't just nod our heads in agreement to Matthew chapter 28, but start to live it out by the spirit of God's power in us. I love how John Piper said it. He said, whatever you do, whatever you do, find the God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated passion for your life and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it. And you will make a difference that lasts. You will not waste your life. We're going to scatter from this place that we've gathered in just a little while. And as we do, what if we took seriously the command to make disciples? What I want you to see is when you go to your office tomorrow, what if your office isn't just an office, but it's a place where you make disciples? What if your house and your kitchen table wasn't just a place where you ate with your family, but it's a place that with your kids and with your neighbors, you realize this is a place God's given me to make disciples. The gym that I go to, the school that I go to, it's not just the place that I get educated or, get, or work out. It's a place that God has given me to do what he's called me to do with the spirit of God empowering me to do it through me. And I'm making Disciples, put this on the bottom shelf for us, Scott. What does it look like? What if it looked like every single one of us just praying for one person that we're a little further down the road on when it comes to spiritual things? God, give me one person to meet with every couple weeks at Starbucks and I can show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. Give me a younger believer that I can show how, how God and his grace has helped me understand spiritual things. Give me somebody to disciple, one-on-one, life-on-life discipleship. What if it looked like you texting and calling some of your friends that don't know Jesus, just asking how you can pray for them. I know from very personal experience over the last few months, as I've done this with some neighbors and some friends that don't know Jesus, and I've just seen spiritual conversations become a reality. And what if we were to take those spiritual conversations and put ourselves out there and say, hey, we've been talking about some spiritual things. Would you ever want to go to a coffee shop every couple weeks and sit down and read a book together? Or sit down and have a conversation about what the Bible says together. What if followers of Jesus trusted what the Spirit of God wants to do in and through them? Super bottom shelf. What if we all just grab some invite cards on our way out? And until we trust the Lord enough and have the courage to do those other things, you just gave these to a few of your friends and said, hey, we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Come be a part of my church as we celebrate Jesus. And we see God, bring a bunch of people here that don't know him that can hear the life-saving, eternal-changing gospel message. And it all started with you just saying, hey, you want to come to the church with me? What if we actually started trusting the Lord to do what only he can do? He is building his church. I'll close with a story that radically changed my life about 20 years ago. I was in college and I was on my way down to Southern California to pick up my cousin from the train station there. And somebody had given me a, a, a sermon CD. You guys remember those things, CDs? <laughs> somebody gave me a CD of the pastor that I quoted earlier, Pastor John Piper. He was speaking at a college conference called Passion One Day. It's from the year 2000 and it was a, a conference, 
several thousand college students one day on a big open field in Texas. As I listened to him preach this message, it changed my life. In this message, he tells the story of two groups of people. The first group of people he talks about is two ladies, one named Ruby and one named Laura. They went to his church and he said, Ruby is a retired single lady, 80 years old. She's a retired nurse. One of her best friends, Laura, is a retired medical doctor. And these two ladies invested their lives and got sent to the nation of Cameroon. And they're just ministering and expanding the kingdom of God there in Cameroon. And they're going village to village, helping with medical needs. And one day as they're driving, their brakes give out. And off a cliff, Ruby and Laura go. And in a moment, they were face to face with their maker, home in the presence of Jesus. He looks across the crowd of all these thousands of college students and he asks the question, is that a tragedy? A couple people murmur, murmur back and forth. He said, is that a tragedy? 20 years after most of their counterparts retired to a life of leisure, these two ladies gave their lives for something that would outlast it. Is that a tragedy? And he says, that's not a tragedy. I'll show you a tragedy. He takes out a piece of paper and it's the most recent edition of the Reader's Digest. Now, full disclosure, I don't know much about Reader's Digest, but maybe you do. He takes out the Reader's Digest and he says, I want to read you an article. This is a tragedy. He starts to read from the article. It's titled, Start Now, Retire Early. He reads, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler playing softball and collecting shells. Some laughs scatter across the room or across the field and Piper is not amused. He looks at the crowd and he says, now that's a tragedy. And he says, there are millions of people in this country spending billions of dollars to get you to buy it. And I've got 40 minutes to plead with you with all my heart, do not buy that dream. The American dream, a nice house, a nice car, a nice job, a nice family, a nice retirement, collecting shells as the last chapter of your life before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account for your life. Here it is, Lord, my shell collection. He said, over and against that, I protest, don't buy it. Don't waste your life. See, we can waste our lives. We can spend our lives. We can invest our lives. So once again, to 15-year-old punk rock Scott and to my church family, to the question, what is the meaning of life? Why do we live? What are we here for? Is there more to this? The answer from the word of God for every follower of Jesus is yes. Yes, yes, yes. You have been invited. You have been invited to something that he is doing and he's inviting you to get in on it. The most epic, life-changing, world-changing, joy-bringing mission ever. To make disciples. That is how we don't waste our lives. Let's pray together this morning. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the weight that we feel that only you can bear in and through us. I pray now as we respond for just a few moments, Lord, you would just be gracious to help us respond well, to help us respond in obedience. Did you sit there and just kind of contemplate what the Lord is teaching you I wonder if you'd ask yourself, are you investing your life, spending your life, or maybe wasting your life? Today could be a day where you change that. Trusting the spirit in you to do what he wants to do through you. Thinking about where you've been placed. Where has God placed you in your school, in your work, in your family to make disciples? What would be a next step in your relationship with God? Were you thinking, God, this is what I'm sensing you're prompting in me to maybe reach out to those people and ask how I can pray for them, to maybe reach out to that younger follower of Jesus and ask how I can walk with them. 
whatever it may be, would we respond in obedience? In just a moment, we're going to have a prayer team down here. And just like the other two services, maybe you just want to come to the altar and just ask the Lord to give you the grace you need to carry out what he's calling you to. Maybe you want to come down here and pray specifically for people that you know that God's placed you in their lives to show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. However the Lord is leading, would we respond in obedience? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, we've talked about this being a home team series, but you need to know Jesus is building his church. And today may be part of that is you coming into the kingdom and meeting Jesus and starting to follow him. That's a part of him building his church. If you'd like to talk to somebody about following Jesus, we'd love to have a conversation with you. However the Lord is responding, we want to be faithful to obey. So God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time to respond now. We love you. We need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.